sponsor of my stream and podcast is DistroKid. If you want 10% off on your first subscription with DistroKid, release your music to the world on every major music platform. Make sure to go to my website, andrewvanzark.com, and click on the discount link under the tab of DistroKid. Attention, Sarkarians. Embark on a cosmic journey at www.andrewvanzart.com. Saving by clicking on our affiliate tab. Discounts await. Your click not only unlocks deals, but supports the beats and discussions of the stellar radio stations. At Radio. Join the Sith and let the unlimited power of the discounts await you in the shopping. And for you musicians to get a discount on DistroKid. www.andermansart.com Your portal to savings. May the discounts be with you. The information on this podcast is my opinion and some internet research. Galaxy's most popular movie is Great Family Entertainment. Huh? Aren't we listening to Galactic Cowboy Radio? Uh, wh- wh- what is this whistling? I, huh? I'm confused. Hosted by Andrew Van Zandt. Now you're listening to Power. Thank you. Now we can start listening to the show. I was so confused. May the force be with you. Hello, hello, and welcome to Galactic Radio. My name is Arcade. This is your safe space to go Star Wars, music, and other geeky topics. And today is the topic we're going to just try and discuss and get ourselves a little bit into, um, you know, Star Trek and similar topics, you know? So, why don't we get ourselves flowing and running with that? You know? So, 420 after. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Glad you could be here. Um, If you don't feel like talking, you can always comment down below. And I'll be glad to check out whatever you have to say. And anyone else, you can share around the show. And get yourself flowing. So, um, I've been a Star Wars fan for as long as I can remember, you know. I was born in 94. I saw the VHS films really little. Um, you know, the original trilogy. Um, I, I, I got into really heavily into Star Wars after the appearance of Darth Maul in the first one. And, uh, from there I started going to different directions, you know? And, uh, I, I can clearly say that I, I knew about the existence of Star Trek, but I never dwelt into it. All, all, all I can remember when I was a little kid was, you know, getting into um, my room, because my brother was born in 91, getting into my room and seeing this big spaceship on one corner. No, no one ever uh, checked what it was about. My mom kind of knew because she saw the original series uh, from the 1960s. Um, 66, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and from there, I was like, oh, what is this spaceship? And it wasn't until like maybe two, three, four years ago, uh, like, like, two, like three years ago, three years ago, I literally checked and it turns out that was the USSS Enterprise. I was like, huh, I've had a Star Trek, uh, spaceship this whole time with me and I didn't even know. Like, come on, that's quite uh, an interesting fact right there, if I might say so myself. And I clearly could, you know, how do I say this? I could clearly have gone into Star Trek by that point in time. And at that point in time, what I did was I saw the entire original series, the 1960s one. I've had prior to that scene, the J.J. Abrams films, which most most Trekkies don't consider it uh, Star Trek. You know, they should say, mm, it, it's just part of the universe. But yeah, I have seen clips here and there of the cartoon version of the original series. And I saw, to, to a certain degree... Deep Space Nine. I skipped for some reason. Uh, the, the second generation is what it's called. Yeah, Star Trek: The Second Generation. 
And, uh, yeah. All right, let's get, uh, back kids in here. Hello, hello, my friend. How we doing? Hey, I heard that you're basically talking about getting a Star Wars fan getting into Star Trek. And as a Star Wars fan, who did get into Star Trek? I thought, you know what? I should be here. You also try to get into Star Trek? Oh, no, I'm already into Star Trek. Oh. That, dude, that's why I called. I called to fulfill my destiny and get more people into Star Trek. Oh, uh, I, I was like, I, I told uh, one of my clients that um, now that I'm going to start slowly incorporating Star Trek stuff into my uh, uh, radio station and stuff like that, I can f f proudly do the Spock hand thing. Right. Look, man, I may be, I'm a Star Wars fan till death. I will never stop being a Star Wars fan no matter how much Disney pisses me off. I'll always be a George Lucas Star Wars fan, 100%. I'll die on that. But I have to acknowledge, all sci-fi fans must acknowledge, Star Trek was the benchmark for everything. Yeah, I'm not. Entertainment like how Star Trek. That's why George Lucas thanked Gene Roddenberry. Because Gene Roddenberry kick-started the trend to take sci-fi seriously. Before Star Trek, the, the average person, if you weren't a nerd or a geek like, like, like me, didn't give a shit about sci-fi. They didn't consider it, you know, worth anyone's time. So it was hard to get it made in the industry. But Star Trek slowly opened the doors towards Star Wars, Star D, and many other great works. Right, can't right. Get away from it. That that is that is pretty interesting because many people attribute Star Wars as the gateway that changed Hollywood in many shapes and forms and, and like inspired a lot of things. Well, Star Wars, it's a bit different. Star Wars is the gateway that changed cinema. Around the time of the 70s, cinema was doom, gloom, depressed nihilism. People were always thinking about how everything was going to fall apart and nothing matters and everyone's going to suffer. And Star Wars brought the hope towards America and the world even that sometimes the good guys beat the bad guys the princesses get saved and the day ends hopeful for another adventure Star Wars impacted entertainment culturally on a global scale you'll find Star Wars references and things you wouldn't expect there's literally manga and anime that that honors Star Wars. That that's how that's how far the reach Star Wars has has impacted culture, in human culture in general. That's how great Star Wars is. But Star Trek, if it wasn't for Star Trek getting, if it wasn't for Star Trek opening the doors for sci-fi fans to be accepted in the mainstream, something like Star Wars could have been even more impossible to make. It was already difficult for George Lucas to get it made because all the studios were turning him down back in the seventies. But without Star Trek being acknowledged in, in, in the film industry at the time, I don't even think Star Wars would have been given a chance by anyone. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I can say that um, even though George Lucas helped shape cinema in, in the way that we produce films, um, I, I can totally agree with you that Star Trek did open the gateway for sci-fi fans to be in the mainstream in many shapes and forms. Yeah. Also, not just that. Star, Star Trek did much more than that. We talk about how Star Wars advanced the minds of culture and entertainment and storytelling itself. That's how great Star Wars is. But Star Trek, to give it its props, advanced the minds of our evolution. Sci Star Trek has inspired scientists and inventors to advance our technology toward what we're towards where we're at now. Gene Roddenberry yeah. had a vision for the type of tech we're using right now, and because he had that vision, he inspired people like Steve Jobs to bring us to where we are. Yeah, exactly. It even though I saw a documentary of Steve Jobs that he he said that why would we want to have internet on our on our palm of our hands? That's a waste of time. Because back then there was a company called Rim, and Rim wanted to say, "Hey, we have this pocket computer. Why don't we just put phone to it?" And he didn't believe in it. 
Yeah. We personally, I don't trust uh, putting internet in our bodies. Like, uh, I don't know, we used to conspiracy not in me, but I just feel like that's some uh, Illuminati, uh, sorry, Illuminati um, uh, um, psyop stuff. But I will be honest, um, technology, like, even the ability to get closer and closer to finally leaving our solar system in space. Like, all that stuff because of Star Trek with medical doctors, how we mm-hmm. do this and, you know, so many things. It's just, yeah, Star Trek, like Star Wars, has impacted storytelling, lore, and entertainment. I won't, yeah, I'm not saying it didn't, but in a, on a greater note, Star Trek has helped our culture and our, our minds, you know, envision a, a utopia where, where, where we're so advanced that we're we're in this like eternal peace like we've gotten to a point where we're very different from our ancestors and we've you know connected with other people on a level that honestly you know just uh seems impossible and honestly that i think that's why i have an issue with a lot of modern trick because a lot of modern trick tries to parallel with society now Mm-hmm. And as a result, they make it, they, they're, they're not even, they're not even subtle or they don't even have, it's not complex or depth. So you have things like in Star Trek Discovery, there's projects, the projects, projects exist in the day of Starfleet, the, the future utopia of Starfleet. I'm like, that just inherently contradicts the idea that we've evolved past our social issues in right now. It's like, you're telling me that we have advanced medicine replicators, that we, we have infinite resources, all this all this stuff, and the projects are still a thing. It's like, I know you're trying to make a point about racial division and class division, but you just completely destroyed the entire narrative of Star Trek. <laughs> How far we've come. Yeah, I've heard that that started to be a thing in Picard. Uh, that's a thing in Picard and Discovery. That's a thing uh, in Modern Trek itself. I don't hate all Modern Trek. There's some I like, but no shows in particular. They try to they try to parallel the real world too much. And like, mm-hmm. I'm not saying Star Trek has never done it before because I'm gonna hear from people. Star Trek was always yeah. I get it. I watch the shows. I I technically grew up on Star Trek. Star Trek did reference the real world even in its golden years it did use social issues as metaphors for a lesson or lecture about a topic it did do those things but my issue with modern Trek is that there's no genius to it there's no complexity there's no inner depth you know there's no um there's there's no profound writing it's just Star Trek is America. Star Trek, modern Star Trek right now is just America 2023 or 2022 or 2020. They dated Star Trek. Oh, they did? Yeah. And modern, yeah. yeah. And, and Kirk, and Kirk, they dated it. Like, when, when I watch Picard or Discovery, I don't see Starfleet. I don't see the far future where we've advanced to a greater echelon. I just see america with advanced tech you know it's like all i see is that this is this is like um the country we live in except we have lasers you know <laughs> I, I think that profoundly has um brought star trek into service but you know that's just me most uh, many star trek fans feel the way i do but there are star trek fans that love everything star trek and think that star trek's on the right track and that it's doing what, it, what what it's always done, and for those people, I strongly disagree. But you know, who cares? Yeah, it's if you like it, you like it. I, I don't like. Um, I like Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine is good. Um, I I do like Picard season three. Picard season three should have been Picard season one because they just they last Jedi the next generation. <laughs> oh, they did. Yeah. Well, okay. Look. Um, you know what? I'm, 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 what I'm doing is wrong. I'm influencing your mind. Watch all the classic shows, then watch modern shows, and you come to your own conclusion, Chatwave. I, I saw, I saw in the pandemic a, a huge a chunk of the original uh, series, yeah. and and that's what got me like really interested in it to the point 
that I bought the two books to learn Klingon. Right. I'm I'm literally that deep into getting into Star Trek that I'm actually learning Klingon. Right. And even Duolingo now has a, a way of, to learn uh, Klingon. And there's a thousand people in the world that speak fluent uh, Klingon. Mm-hmm. And it would be interesting. I, I was thinking, hey, there's a lot of fans of of, of Star Trek. Um, there's even conventions based on Star Trek. Yeah, there is. That Star Trek, like I said, Star Trek is. It's you know you know all people. I don't know if you heard this. People call Lord of the Rings Tolkien for it's the Bible of fantasy. Right. People call Star Trek the Bible of sci-fi because it technically is. It didn't just it impacted so many things. It also impacted science fiction. Yep. Yeah, and and one of the board games that you see in Star Trek, you can actually buy it on Amazon. One of these days, I'm gonna get myself some three. I'm gonna buy myself a three dimensional chess set. I just need to Amazon. Amazon, yeah, yeah, I've seen some on Amazon. I'm gonna buy myself a three dimensional chess set, and then I'm going to like get someone to play with me. <laughs> and I, 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 I suck at chess. I used to know <laughs> oh, younger. But I suck at it. I'm really bad at it. I know I know how to move the pieces. Yeah, I just don't know how to defend myself. Dude, currently I suck at regular chess. How do you think I'm gonna do three dimensional? <laughs> you 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 you'll suck three dimensionally. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a whole new dimension of sucking. Yeah. Suck it, suck it, suck it. Oh, I, 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 I just hurt. I, oh god. Oh my god. <laughs> myself what the fuck man no you okay no no i'm just i'm just joking with you i'm just I'm just being serious but if i want to be real with you i'll chat with you um my advice is and this technically to classic star trek fans this is heresy so when i say this um and if you ever have like if, if you ever have listeners you, if, if they listen, if they're Star Trek fans, they may strongly disagree with what I'm going to tell you. But if you really want to get into Star Trek, my advice is to start with the Kelvin films. Star Trek 2009, Star Trek Ultra Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. Now, I do like these movies. These are movies made by J.J. Abrams. That's quite how critical I, I have been on the man. And the truth is... I knew about Star Trek my entire life as a geek or a nerd. I knew about it. I was pretty well versed in it, but I wouldn't call myself much of a fan because it didn't interest me much. I just knew about it, you know, because I watched it and I I grew up with it. But I wasn't much of a fan. But it took watching the Kelvin movies to get me invested into classic, more invested into classic Star Trek. So when 2009 came out, Into Darkness came out, and Beyond came out, and I watched all of them, each time I was like, you know what? I think I'm starting to like Star Trek more. And then I went back and I watched all the original shows, all the original movies, and I started reading comics and everything. And I, I became a Star Trek fan based on those Kelvin films. I, you'll have old, old, like old guard Star Trek fans that'll argue how these Kelvin films are just flashy action and dumb American, you know, tropes, Hollywood tropes, and they don't get the true complexities and intricacies of Star Trek. And I'll say, technically they're right, but these films tried. They tried. They they took some complex topics that you would find in the original shows, and they explored them while still trying to hook people into hook yo hook yo people into Star Trek that like modern sci-fi. So I'd say if you really want to get into Star Trek, start with those movies, and then you'll find yourself binging everything that's older. Another reason why I like those movies is because they did what the sequel trilogy didn't do. And they respected what came before. <laughs> and the irony is that G.G. Abrams directed the first two. But here's the thing. G.G. Abrams is not a Star Trek fan. He was a Star Wars fan. So. Hence why there is uh, the r 2 uh, cameos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hence why that's the case. But it's like, because of that... He gave it to other people, Kurtzman included, who does modern Trek that I just that I mostly despise, who know Star Trek more. And Robert Orchie is one of I think he he's he's the screenwriter for like the first three that was around for 
2009 Into Darkness and Beyond. There's other writers, Kurtzman included, who I'm very critical of, but he was there. And I honestly, this is my personal opinion. I won't say it's objective fact. I'm pretty sure he is the ble- the beating heart of the scripts behind those films. Because after watching Modern Trek with Into Darkness and uh, Picard, not Into Darkness, Discovery of Picard, I am pretty damn sure Kurtzman will not be genius behind those movies. He did he did co-write them, so I won't take that away from him, but I just have a hard time believing, you know, he also wrote he, he also um put passion into those movies because I I compared the Kelvin films to Modern Trek, which it technically is a part of Modern Trek, the Kurtzman era. And I just I don't see the passion in Discovery and Picard for the most part than I see in those Kelvin movies as flawed as the older Star Trek fans consider them to be. So if you ask me, I think Robert Orchie, he was one of the writers, co-writers on, on, on all three, 2009, Into Darkness and Beyond. I think mm-hmm. he's the reason why the scripts work. That's just my opinion. Either way, those films themselves, I think will get any non-Star Trek fan or casual more into Star Trek because while it while they are while they are filled with Hollywood tropes and action and adventure they're also, they also have a lot of uh, the passion that old classic Trek had and they respect the original continuity of Star Trek and they respect it by doing what Disney can and should have done and creating a whole new continuity that coexists with the original. Because George Lucas, I already said in a previous space on this, he had a multiverse, he had different continuities for Star Wars, and his canon was the main one, the main universe. But when Disney got Star Wars, they decanonized every continuity, Lucas canon, EU included, and just made their own Disney canon. So now, when they fuck up, their canon is the only canon we have for Star Wars content. So when fans are mad that they have to remind themselves that a Luke Skywalker appearance or a Boba Fett appearance or any of that is tied to that horrible sequel trilogy, it's going to be harder for Disney to make money because they're going to know that these fans don't want to watch anything tied to the sequel trilogy. And unfortunately, Disney canon is 100% tied to it. But with the Kelvin movies... They make it clear off the gate that the Kelvin the Kelvin universe is an alternate timeline to the main universe of the original Trek due to time travel. So when they make these changes to the characters in this timeline, it does not erase or affect or retcon what made original Trek great. And on top of that, the characters from past Star Trek are given better cameos than the original trilogy cast in the sequel trilogy. They're not bastardized. They're not demonized. And it works. There, mm-hmm. there are flaws, but it works. And there's clear respect towards classic Trek in those movies, in my opinion, that the sequel trilogy, by comparison, does not have for George Lucas Star Wars in any way, shape, or form. And I think, right. Yeah, I think one of the main reasons is because they screwed up the lore of George Lucas Star Wars, made it all one timeline, made it all one continuity, and now the sequel trilogy is what you have to deal with. The D- Disney canon is what you have to deal with. You can't go away to any other Star Wars continuity because they're all decanonized. Mm-hmm. You can't get Lucas's sequel trilogy. His which check out George check out George's ideas for for a sequel trilogy. They're way more interesting than whatever fuck Disney did. And yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. You can't get EU. You can't get Dark Empire. You can't get Air City. You can't get those stories because Disney just got rid of all of it, and they just have their canon, which. I want to be honest, for the most part, sucks. There's stuff in it I like, Rebels, The Mandalorian, but for the most part, shit content. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not, there's, there's no consistency. So despite having one continuity only, there are more plot holes in it than holes in Swiss cheese. So it's like, it's just a mess to be a Star Wars fan now. But at least with the horrible abomination of Kurtzman, Trek, in my opinion, 
at least Star Trek fans can just enjoy the old shows and not have them be bastardized by, you know, the uh, the new shows because different continuities. Mm-hmm. It's not the case for Star Wars. We have we have to accept now that George's legendary sixth film saga is tied to Jake Skywalker and Green Titty Milk. We have to accept that. <laughs> And it was milk to a degree that's unnatural. I prefer blue milk. Blue milk all day. If there's one good thing Disney has done is letting blue milk be put in stores, I just need to find where they're selling it so that I can get my hands on it. Yes, that tastes amazing. Oh, man, you went to Galaxy's Edge and tried some blue milk, didn't you? I've tried it. I've been there twice. You lucky bastard. And I've had the green and the blue milk. So how did the green milk taste? Tropical. Oh, you know what? Maybe maybe Jake was on to something in the last Jedi when he went to the swing of that shit. <laughs> he got high and in some blue milk. Hey, I heard red milk is a thing because I think I saw a cameo of it. So uh, oh, I wonder man. if they'll ever if they'll ever make red milk. I, I remember the last time I went to Galaxy's Edge, I had blue milk with some pop rocks on the top of it. Oh. And it was like an explosion of flavors. By the way, uh, this is from the EU. So it's some fun EU trivia. Right. You want to know what's Link's favorite drink in the EU? Ooh, what is it? Hot chocolate. <laughs> I, 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 you're kidding me not. Oh, it's not. Let, in, in, read Air to the Empire. Read the comic. The book of the comic, Lando introduces hot chocolate to Luke and he literally tells C3PO this is the best thing I've ever tasted. Wow. And, uh, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a scene in a Booker comic, I believe, where Grandmaster E. Luke is like, keep 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 the hot keep keep the hot chocolate coming because the restaurant was or the bar, whatever they were in was giving hot chocolate and he wanted more. So yeah, uh, in the EU, Luke's favorite drink is hot chocolate, and that confirms to me that Luke has a weird milk obsession. <laughs> he probably saw one of those animals, and he started sucking on that. It's really in the rims of my I was like, you know what? This is the goat. This is the shit. Yeah, what am I talking about weird obsession? He's a farm boy. Farm boys grow up on milk. I'm such a fucking retard. <laughs> exactly, farm boy. You know. Yeah. Our boys do weird shit. But green milk is horrible, so I, I, I'm i sorry. I just, I, look, it may taste tropical, but, like, it just, no. Just, why why couldn't they pick a different color? Why green? Yeah, green, green, green looks like uh, if Yoda barfed on my drink. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> but one thing I wanted to mention before starting my, my, my radio show here, I wanted to play some Star Trek music on my radio station. Oh, please do. I'll mute myself so that. And, and what I, and surprisingly, what I played was literally Kelvin stuff. Yeah, dude. Okay. I don't know. The Kelvin Star Trek music is great, especially for the first movie. The, what I like is they take the original theme of Star Trek from the original series and they fucking remix the shit out of it and make it sound hip and cool. In my opinion, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, the first one, um, the, the soundtracks for Into Darkness and Beyond are pretty good, but I don't think they're as memorable as 2009. Right, right. Yeah. It, it, that was interesting that, that you said, oh, uh, you, you should start this route, which is, I actually saw those films in the theater. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my brother was in 12th grade. I was like way younger. So I barely remember. Oh, please go. Go back and watch. Most Star Trek fans will not tell you that. Most Star Trek fans will say, start with the original show from the 60s. Start with that. Just watch everything in order. But the reason why I recommend watching it is because outsiders that aren't into the endless talking and, uh, like, look, to me, I get it and I like it, but... For many hyper fast young people now, they want their action, they want their adventure, and you know, that's what those films give you, you know? And if you get into that, and if you get into that and you get invested in the ideas, 
the the, the Kelvin films have, you'll you'll realize they're based on the original shows, the original Star Trek, and then you'll go back and watch that, and uh, you'll get more invested into that. You know, at least that's what happened to me. I can't say it's the same for everyone, but I think it works. And for anyone that's trying to get into Star Trek, I'd say start with the Kelvin films. And then go back to the old shit. The new stuff, I will tell you not to watch, but I will say that I'm just not a fan of most of it. What, what, what is your opinion on those uh, comedy shows they've done? Oh, Lower Decks? Lower Decks and the other one, uh, the one that was in Nickelodeon. Strange New World? Oh, no, Prodigy. You're talking about Prodigy. I watched the first episode of Prodigy and got bored. I, I Like, the trailer was interesting to me, but the episode was not grabbing my attention. I might give it another chance. Lower Decks, I have mixed feelings on because in, like, the first episode, I started to see, like, the, all the modern... Um, messages in it uh, bitching about Starfleet and stuff and it's like you know and of course you have the girl you have the girl boss which is the main character but mm -hmm. as the as the early episodes continued I started seeing more complexity in the cartoon and, I, and the comedy started working as a Star Trek fan if you're a Star Trek fan all the callbacks in Lower Decks are hilarious and the characters they're not just vehicles for, tw for post 2020 messages they're Actually interesting they're quirky but the show does have its flaws and um i would say the comedy doesn't always work but lower decks is not as bad as uh i think many older fans find it my only issue of lower decks is that they did put it in the main canon they put it in the main canon of star trek and i'm like this is like teen titans go it's a parody of star trek in my mind so it's like i don't I don't buy that it takes place in the same continuity as the 60s show. I don't buy that Starfleet officers act this goofy or, you know, stuff. So it's like, I just, I can't buy it in the main timeline. It works better as like some alternate universe parody, kind of like how Teen Titans Go is another Earth in the DC multiverse. That would make more sense, but they put it in the main timeline and uh, it just confuses me. But yeah, mm -hmm. aside from that... I don't have many, if any, issues with Lower Decks, although it can be forgettable sometimes, but I will give it its props, um, Chatwave. It has lasted for a very long time, out of all the Star Trek shows and their feelings, Lower Decks does have an audience, and it, well, it does have some controversy, especially with older fans who just don't like the tone and the Rick and Morty-esque um, feel of it. Mm -hmm. It does have an audience, and they, they 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 like what they're watching. It's it's not the worst out of Kurtzman era Star Trek, but for for me, that's reserved for Discovery and Picard. Those two, I think, have honestly ruined the um the, the potential to make Star Trek interesting with new generations. Now, Star Trek is in a worse state than Star Wars, I would say, whereas Disney Star Wars is getting hate. But current Trek is barely getting acknowledged at all, except for scenes that people will call cringe. And I think, my personal opinion, it's worse to be forgotten than hated. To be hated, that's, you know, yeah, that, that sucks. But to be forgotten, that's death. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah. Do you think it's going to be like the last straws of Star Trek and they're going to just kill it there? I think Star Trek will, for the most part, um, die of obscurity, and the only thing that could potentially amp up Star Trek again, and I'll get hate for saying this, is Star Trek IV in the Kelvin timeline. Like, that oh. film has been in production hell for years, but if they actually made a fourth sequel to Star Trek Beyond and continued with um, the Kelvin timeline um, versions of Kirk's crew on the, on, on the Enterprise... I feel like that would rake in attention compared to most of modern Trek shows. Because they already botched modern Trek. But the Kelvin films now add as a bigger audience than it did when it first came out. Despite the controversies it, it has. And if they do make a fourth one, I think it will make people start remembering Star Trek again in the mainstream anyway. Yeah, because... 
One thing I've noticed when I started going to Comic Con and all those and all those uh, type of conventions, I used to see a lot of people with uh, different shirts of Star Trek. Now, recently, I barely see anyone dressed as any Star Trek uh, character. Yeah, the only two trip the the only two positive trending things for Star Trek I've seen is. Something lower, something in lower decks, or the potential for Star Trek Four to be green lighted again and made. Aside from that, it's mostly negative. You know, it's mostly just posting cringe stuff about uh, what's in the shows, even when they're getting better to sell it. And on top of all that, the only only the fringe Star Trek fans that are just happy with whatever Star Trek does, especially modern Trek. Those are the only people that are enjoying this stuff, and they're rare compared to the heaves of people that feel like Star Trek betrayed them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and these shows are losing ratings, so I, I honestly don't think the, this fringe group of dedicated fans who chill for anything Star Trek does, I don't think they're enough. And I, yeah, I'm sorry if I use the word chill, but like... Seriously, like if, if you're if you're a hive mind, if you're gonna be the fuck at work and tell me that there's nothing wrong with anything in modern Trek and that I just had a touch or I never understood Star Trek at all, I, I just you're the Borg. <laughs> you're a hive <laughs> mind. Like uh, the whole point of classic Trek was diversity of opinion. Not just not just diversity, but diversity of opinion. Gene Roddenberry, if you read a lot of his quotes, he always talks about different opinions, colliding, people having a discussion. And when modern Trek fans tell like Trek fans like Lil that we're out of touch or we never understood Star Trek or whatever for 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 our criticisms or opinions, it's like you're betraying the vision Gene Roddenberry had for a future society. Like, right? Yeah. These these people think they're the USS Enterprise. They think they're Starfleet, but they're the Borg. <laughs> if like, if you can't disagree, you know that that was the issue with the Borg. You know, yeah, the Federation was progressive, but they allowed back and forth. They allowed dialogue. They they allowed discussion. The book with the Borg. You're if you don't agree with the hive mind, then you're gonna be bored. <laughs> You know, yeah, we're gonna be indoctrinated. Yeah, for for sure. And now, speaking of modern and classic uh, Star Trek, um, speaking of those two things, who do you think is better, Kirk or Picard? Got yeah, Kirk all the way. I don't know if it's bias. It's probably bias, but Kirk to me is just the coolest. Captain, he's cooler than Cisco. He's cooler than Picard. I, I just feel that way personally. Yep, and it, it's funny how he's the only like actor that loved going to conventions. Well, yeah, everyone loved Kirk. Unfortunately, everyone did not love William Shatner. <laughs> no, uh, every time I see William Shatner, I can stop think. But hey, look, it's Savior. Especially uh, George Takei, boy, that guy hates William Shatner. I, I honestly don't. I don't understand the hate. I don't get it. Neither do I. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm really excited to get in started with uh, Star Trek for reals because I did on the pandemic sit down and started watching a lot of the uh, original series. Good. It, it's great. And it, it's, it's good stuff. Though. And. It's funny how my dad, every time he would see me on the living room watching it, he was like, why are you watching that old shit? And I'm like, excuse me? This is not shit. This is good. It's good 60s films. Good 60s TV show. Yeah. Yeah, he he says, I don't don't like uh, Star Wars that much. But I think Star Wars is way better. You, you know, you got the action and the laser swords, and I'm like, uh, they're good in their own in their own ways. You know, at least that's my opinion with when it comes to comparing Star Trek to Star Wars. Even though I don't know why there was this huge debate whether Star Trek or Star Wars, when in my opinion, um, they're both completely different. 
they are completely different. They're uh, first of all to clarify. Star Wars is Star Wars has sci-fi stuff in it. It has science fiction in it, but Star Wars is not science fiction overall. It's science fantasy. It's it's mm-hmm. it's like the Force. It's all mystical. There is there tech in it? Sure, but it's all about faith. And Star Trek is about evidence. It's about you know science. So it's like the the overall tones of both are polar opposite. The most sci-fi Star Wars has been is A New Hope because there was more focus on the world and the tech than the Force. Mm-hmm. So you know every other film after has been very mystical focused. So it's like. Yeah, but on top of all that, uh, do not remind me of the Star Wars Star Trek fandom wars. These wars waged on for years, and we literally went at each other because Star Wars and Star Trek were the most known sci-fi things ever, and we wanted to prove that our thing was better. So we kept fighting each other, debating each other, and all that stuff, and we finally made peace. The fandoms finally made peace on the agreement that Twilight sucks. We both came to the conclusion that Twilight's far the worse than either of our franchises, and we became friends. Mm-hmm. That is that is good that the discussion of who's better actually ceased because I, I never understood the, the whole debate. There's even a parody film where they they do like the Star Trek and the, the Trekkies versus the Star Wars fans, and I'm like. Uh, I don't see why would you guys be arguing. They're both good in their ways, and they're both different styles, and they both serve different purposes. Well, and this all uh, <laughs> this really rough ruffles some feathers. But the Star Wars, the Star Wars Star Trek fandom wars was the equivalent of Christian atheist debates. Like, <laughs> like. <laughs> The Star Trek fans are like, your dumb sci-fi franchise is all based on this mystical force that helps people. Like, like we, we, we have, we have evidence. We have, we, our, our show goes over actual science. Your show, your, your, your stuff has fake science. And like, fuck off. Like, <laughs> like, they're just going on about how the force and all, everything in Star Wars is just so, uh, nonsensical and too fantasy. It's like, look, the genius of Star Wars is the morals and the philosophy, and yes, the fantasy is badass, so go fuck yourselves. I was obviously on the Star Wars side of that war. I mean, I, both I for sure. Yeah, I may have grown up on both, and I was well-versed on both, and I had a respect for Star Trek for what it did for sci-fi, but I, 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 I knew where my side lied, but... You know, as time passed, I grew to appreciate both. And while I will always pick Star Wars over Star Trek, I do love Star Trek. And I will always be a Star Trek fan. Just not on the level of Star Wars. Exactly. One thing I, one thing I can say, the one of the reasons why I got more into Star Wars than I did with Star Trek is that Star Wars has video games. Star Trek barely has any video games and most of the most of them suck ass. Yeah, no fair. I mean, most Star Trek games I could think of, I remember on the mobile apps. The mobile apps and that and that game that tried to be the War of the Warcraft, the Star Trek. Yeah, and and they all did pretty mid, in my opinion. And one thing that I remember as a kid was that all the video games was was what kept me more into Star Wars because I was playing Episode 3 all the time. Specifically, that Episode 3 had like a Street Fighter kind of style game in the multiplayer. And that kind of stuff, when I was younger, caught my attention because I used to be really heavy on the interactive stuff. Yeah. And Star Trek didn't add any for me to kept getting interested because when I was young... Even though I watched a lot of TV, I, I listened to the radio a lot and all that, I wasn't really that like, oh, I got to watch this at the certain day of the week because this is happening. You know, it wasn't until I got to 16 years old or 15 years old that I actually got to that thing of, oh, there's schedules for me to watch things. Right. And video games got me to keep that consistency of enjoying more Star Wars because I, I I have in my game room a plethora of video games of Star Wars. But what do I have a Star Trek? Just an Enterprise toy and, and, and hanging from my roof. 
I better hope your audience isn't full of Star Trek fans, because if they find out where you live, oh boy, I am, I really hope, I really hope for your well-being. What, are, are, are they more toxic than Star Wars fans? I'm just making a joke. Um, fandoms overall, they have their extremists. Star Trek, Star Wars, doesn't matter. But I don't like that word toxic fan. I don't like it because current day mainstream media has associated toxic fan with not liking a modern product of a franchise you love. Toxic, actual genuine toxic fans are people that stalk, try to physically harm you know, celebrities or send death threats, shit like that. That's toxic. Like, if I'm being objective, that's fucking toxic. Saying the last Jedi sucks and, uh, you know, that, that's not fucking toxic. That's an opinion. So, like, I don't, I don't like the word, hearing the word toxic fan anymore because toxic fan has just become a term for any fan that doesn't like what's out right now. And to me, it, it just became a slur. In the fandom, it's just a slur for for fans that don't like what these what these companies are doing right now. So, yeah, I don't use it. I just yeah, I I see, I see where you're, where you're going. I see what you mean. But you sometimes what I when I use the word toxic in a fan, usually I mean the type of fan that would literally verbally harass you just because you said you like the modern version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I could see the uh, the toxicity in that a bit. And then they, and then they start stalking you and sending you messages on on Twitter or something like, well, "How can you like this? Do I, I hope you better kill yourself for liking Star Wars: The Last Jedi." My God, like I, I've I've seen that. Yeah, I, I, I you know it's not. You're right. It's not one sided. There are cases where people that don't like what's out right now take it to an extreme that's not normal. So you have a point there, sir. Yeah, and I've seen that not only in Star Wars, but I've seen that in my girlfriend's favorite franchise, Supernatural. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> dude. There are people that are literally ripping off their skin over the finale. So I'm not surprised. But this is this is fandom. Like fan is short for fanatic. So automatically that that's already extreme. If you're a fan, you're crazy about something. And it's like it doesn't matter what it is. It could be sports. It could be uh it could be toilet paper. It could be your your toes. Whatever you're a fan of, you're always gonna have that portion that are so extreme with it, it's beyond any type of rationality, you know. Exactly. Yeah, there's this. Uh, speaking of that, you reminded me of an old news. I, I'm really heavy into the Japanese culture, and you and me both, my friend. Yes, and I've been, and I and I listen to a lot of Japanese artists and bands and all that stuff. And I used to listen to a lot to the one that did Sugar Rush for Wreck It Ralph, aka aka B48. And one of the fans was so obsessed with one of the singers that he literally brought an axe to a concert and threw it at her face. And then she had to get medical attention in the middle of the concert and they had to cancel the concert. What the hell? And all and all because he couldn't have her as a girlfriend. What the f Okay, that's just flat out attempted murder. Yep. <laughs> that's insane. Fans can get crazy. No, they can. They can. Uh, and I'll never understand why why some fans would always get so obsessed to the point they feel like they possess whatever it is, even if it's a fictional character. Like I've seen people say, be so obsessed with like Kylo Ren to the point that they feel they they possess the actor. Oh, did you hear about those real little fans that sent death threats to Adam Driver's wife because him and Daisy Ridley weren't a thing in real life? That was hilarious. I'm like, really, guys? <laughs> what the fuck? Like, look, I'm not the person to say this. I'm a very out there, fan fanatical, mystical guy. I'm not grounded. I'm not about, you know, seriousness all the time or any of that. But it's they're fucking movies. Are, are you seriously surprised the actors aren't really together? Not that, the, not that the characters being together made any fucking sense to begin with, but really? <laughs> Are you surprised Adam Driver has a wife and Daisy Ridley is not with Adam? Okay. Why not? Sure. Send your death threats. To a fictional story. I know, yeah. 
god. <laughs> like, come on. What is this, Family Guy? Dude, they literally made, these railers literally made endless tweets telling J.J. Abrams to kill himself for killing off Kylo Ren and Rise of Skywalker. I was sitting here, I'm like, I don't like this movie, and I'm very critical of J.J. Abrams with but you're telling this man to murder himself because he killed off a character in your in, in a movie. That that is bonkers. Am I am I right? Yeah, and I'm like, okay, you want to make this real? Let's make this real. Kyle Ren is a space terrorist. He's a space terrorist. You're just obsessed with a space terrorist. You're, you're telling real life people to kill themselves. Because a space terrorist died in a fictional story. Okay, well, why not? Whatever. Wow. That's the same thing as when Jar Jar Binks came out and they were literally sending death threats to the actor that did Jar Jar Binks. And they made a website called JarJarBinksShouldDie.com. And it was literally people in a, like a Reddit style website writing death threats and, and making fun of the actor, not Dodger Binks himself, the actor behind Dodger Binks, to the point that it drove the actor nuts. And he was this close to commit suicide on the bridge, on a bridge nearby his house. What the fuck? But so oh, right. I heard about that. Thanks for money. Yeah, and it, it's so sad how toxicity can get to that point. Just over a fictional character. Just because it's funny. No funny. Wait, is, uh, and this is something Lucas and the crew did. They don't, they, well, they don't blame the fans for prequel hate. They blame the media. And the reason why they blame the media is because the media is the one that was spamming fan opinions out there. Like it was, you know, fan hate opinions about the prequels. Like it was gospel. And they played on prequel hate for money. So they would bring on people in the prequels. They would have people complain about the prequels and they would mass produce that shit they were caught like the media guys would go in the interviews with Jake Lloyd and harass him about you know the prequels like the media is the reason why a lot of these actors were remembered for the prequels if people didn't like them and it affected their career so not saying the fans have no responsibility they do but if it wasn't for the media as George Lucas says fan opinions would not be seen like they're legit fact everywhere and these people would not be getting harassed. The cast and George actually had a great appreciation for the fans and George even just said that the fans had disagreed with him. You know? He was cool. He didn't he it's not it's like it's not that he was he liked their hatred or their disagreements with the prequels, but he wasn't attacking the fans or hating on the fans for not liking his movies. He just explained why he thought they didn't like his movies. So, what one difference between George Lucas and Disney is that Disney right now, they're blaming their fans. They're calling them all sorts of slurs and accusing them of horrible things because they didn't like the sequel trilogy. But George criticized the media for taking fan opinions and using them as a way to make money. And George was correct. George predicted cancel culture before cancel culture. Culture. <laughs> I can see that now, and and, and it's kind of crazy. George Lucas predicted everything in in the in the media, and media, everything. And, and Steven Spielberg. No, George's friend John Milius made Red Dawn, and Red Dawn obviously was an anti-communist movie. It was pretty conservative leaning. That film got hate from Hollywood and the media, and John Milius. Like he was in deep shit with Hollywood, and he was he was gonna get canceled back in the eighties and nineties over his movie, his anti-communist movie. George, who was who's a friend of John, along with a couple other filmmakers, Stephen and other guys, they had to defend John Milius and explain that he's not a bad guy. And even during the Phantom Menace, where people where the media was attacking George Lucas, accusing him of racism and all this stuff for for the Phantom Menace. Especially with Jar Jar George went on an interview and said, look, this is just the media, you know, trying to make money, accusing the film of being racist. Like, George literally called out the media for trying to make bank off accusing him and his film of being racist towards different people. He called out cancel culture before that was a known thing on the internet. 
Henry. It's insane. He did it twice. Yeah, I, I, I can see that, and it's crazy. Yeah. Um. So to get back to um, what the title says of this uh, space. Um, I'm. A, I would actually want to get. I actually want to get into the Star Trek universe too. I've only uh, seen the like the first ten episodes of the original Star Trek uh, from the sixties. Well, the the bad kid here is the expert in Star Trek. Hey now, hey now, hey, you watched it too. You watched it too. You may not, you may not be as into it as I am, but you watched it too. <laughs> Putting you in the spotlight there, so you know you'd be like, we have the spotlight, but for get back here, get back here, get over here. I did hear, I did hear that Star Trek. Uh, Deep Space Nine was considered pretty special. Oh, yeah. Well, when it first came out, it got hate from fans for being too dark and being too uh, gritty. I, I, I remember. Okay. But a ri- that's what I like about it. Yeah, and that's what many people liked about it. Um, You know, but as time passed, people grew to appreciate it, and now it's a classic like the rest. Having, having dark stuff... It's what drives me into. That's why I liked a lot of the last season of the Bad Badge because the last, the last season of the Bad Badge, actually was completely gritty and dark, and that's what made me get more into the Bad Badge. And now, hate me as you much, you will. I think Bad Badge is a little higher in my uh, hierarchy uh, than what Clone Wars is. I, I I lowered it a little bit for some reason. I don't know if anyone's gonna hate me for that, but. You know the bad, but the bad batch for me is a bit uh, more interesting now than what Clone Wars ever did. Even though Clone Wars is longer, has better story, and almost everything that we love from Star Wars came from the Clone Wars. Wait, what? Um, no, the um Star Wars, the Clone Wars, two thousand eight that came. Uh, well, unless you're talking about the multimedia project from the EU when uh who, who brought up who brought up um the call words I thought I thought you was talking about the Bad Batch yeah I'm just saying that the the way that connected to the call words though I, 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 I was just saying that since I like gritty and dark stuff just as how Deep Space Nice is and thanks to the dark yeah. and greediness of the third season of the Bad Batch, I, I placed it higher in my likings of all the cartoons of uh, of Star Wars than Clone Wars, just because the last season is completely dark and gritty. That that is the whole reason. And, uh, I I respect that opinion. Um, it's just uh, me personally, I don't I don't uh, judge uh, my appreciation for things based on its. Uh, Based on its amount of greediness or or fine words, you know, but like, uh, like I hear a lot of people say that they like Empire or uh, Revenge of the Sith because it's the darker ones. I don't really care about that. I I think it's like icing on the cake, but mm-hmm. I don't like it because it's dark. <laughs> I, I like Star Wars in general for many different reasons, but uh, those type of details get me more invested in the story because it gives a bit more depth to the characters. Like, sure, we, we met Anakin when he was a kid, and then he grew up, he got involved with Padme and all that. But for some reason, something about Revenge of the Sith just makes me get more into the whole character of, of Anakin, you know, it's, it's, I see a deeper connection and a more depth into his, uh, lower end and character. Well, I mean, uh, they do spend the first 20 minutes of the film trying to establish, uh, the best, the best friend, uh, brother's sort of relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan visually and, and uh, through the dialogue, yeah, yeah. I'll uh, chat with you. Like, it's off of Rob and uh, yeah, Madigan. If you ever want to come on, give it a shot. But I'm gonna bow out. And uh, I usually say made a horse do it, you, but it, but you know, to honor the title of yours on your space, live long and prosper. Yes, live long and prosper. Actually, I already hit the one hour mark. It's when my show ends. 
because uh, I only have one hour in my radio station. So right. yeah, live long and prosper. Long and prosper. And uh, take care, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Adios, amigos. Bye. Unite for the sound revolution in Galactic Jaguar Radio. Support Anna Ranzark's original tunes, the polls of our online radio station, and keep the news blazing like Beskar. Click, donate, and hit that PayPal button, and join the watch. Keep the tunes alive. This is the way.